probably asking, Doug, what? Have you ever made false assumptions about people? Have you ever thought that you had somebody pegged that you knew what they were all about? That because of the way they looked, the way they talked, the way they conducted themselves, that that's who they were. Have you ever found yourself making a mistake in that area? Have you ever thought, well, you know, they got long hair and they got, you know, holy jeans or they got tattoos, you know, and I don't know if they're ever going to become a, you know, qualified, bona fide, genuine, one of the true Christians. Hmm. I laugh about that because, see, I was a hippie. And I was also a successful businessman. Up to a degree. I worked for other people behind the scenes on a regular basis because I was kind of like the problem solver, the administrative assistant, the guy that made you look good behind the scenes so that you could get your job done because I took care of all your other issues that were going on. And as a later in life network engineer, as a computer geek, as a techie savvy person, I was able to coordinate a lot of information in the same way and to do that for lots of ministries as well as for business. But the point is, when I come to you such as I am, you have one set of expectations. You have a personal view that you see me as. Shirt and tie. Looking good. Looking shiny. Maybe. But then again, there's uh, other times where, you know, you just got to take the coat off, you know, roll up your sleeves and get dirty. And, uh, When you show yourself in a different light, then a person changes their idea about you. When I was laying 89 pounds in a hospital bed, thin as a rail, able to reach around most of my limbs with my hand, not much to be said about that person. Doesn't look like a Christian. Looks like there must be sin in their life. Or was there? Looks like they must be dying or would he? Hmm. Man tends to judge on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. When I went from that type of disability to ability, it wasn't that I was healed because I still had consequences of the disease that had ravaged my body and had made me ill, but I was so adamant about my own personal self-esteem because of the way people treated me that I went out of my way to work hard. I went to jobs that I probably never should have been able to apply for, and I got them. And the funny thing is, is when I got into those jobs, I realized that, you know, most of the people that were doing their job around me learned it on the job. It wasn't as though they knew it ahead of time. Most of what they had to learn, they learned by experience. What's your experience say about Someone with a suit. Oh, are their fingers dirty? Do they have calluses on their hands? Or are they just a bookworm? Are they just tender? Because you see, sometimes we don't know where that person's come from or what God's going to do with that person. And with me, I can't think of a better example. From completely laying in a hospital bed dying to putting on a suit and tie and getting myself recognized in business and accomplished in ways that I never thought I would have. And I was just as shocked as the person who hired me to find out that I could do the job. And I did lots of them and I enjoyed them. And it was a fine corporate time. But you know, there came a time where I said, you know what? I don't like wearing suits and ties. You know, I'm getting tired of kind of this corporate mentality about I'm acceptable because I'm wearing the right clothes. I'm saying the right things. So I went out of my way to find a job to work like a man. You know what I mean. To get a job where you got dirty. Where you went out there and you worked a good, oh, 
12 hour days, you know, and you, you could sit with the best of them. You could sit around and guzzle beer if you wanted to. You know, you could sweat like a pig and talk like a hog, you know, and get with the guys, be one of the rough toughs, you know, and hear what they had to do on their vacations when they weren't working as a boiler maker, journeyman boiler maker. Now, how does a geek get to be a journeyman boiler maker? How does a hippie get to be a network engineer? How does the Holy Spirit move you and make you into whatsoever he chooses to so that you could become all things to all men, lest by any means some might be saved? The truth is, it's just a willingness. You just go. You just do it. You just accept that God is in control. You try things you never tried before. You do things you never thought you could do. I know the first time I went out on my job, let's see, I got hired on as a, I think it was a fire watch. Matter of fact, thank you, Industra. When I got hired on a fire watch, I was going to a mill. You know, I think it was up in the state of Washington. And uh, there were lots of us, and we sat through a safety meeting, you know, and we got trained, and I get on the job the first day, and within two hours, they promoted me from a fire watch up to an assistant welder, you know, a welder's assistant. And so I began to help him, you know, and as I began to help him, and I talked to people, and I worked for my foreman, they began to train me, and by golly, I started moving up into the company and got promoted up into wages that were insane. <laughs> and I began to become... One of the dependable people, one of the quote unquote Christians, but I didn't tell them that. I just did my job. And so as I learned by listening to these rough and tough, hard working men, I just did my work with the best that I could and God gave me the capability to do it. I worked 10, 12 at times, you know, for 10 days, that means 10 days straight, 12 hours a day, work straight through. And as I did other jobs that were even longer and sometimes in hotter conditions and worse conditions, I got promoted up to journeyman boilermaker or to boilermaker, the journeyman boilermaker. And then I got promoted to, of all things, OSHA, safety coordinator. Wow, more money. And went on a job and was back to seem like the suit and tie routine because I no longer was sweating it out and toughing it out and working it out in a long, hard, sweaty environment. As a matter of fact, I got to that point where though I walked around and told everybody what to do and gave these wonderful safety meetings and did those things that were important, it was still just me. He was still just a person who happened to have started off as a disabled person who God touched by his grace and mercy and changed into the image of his son and took him from glory to glory into the incorruptible image of his son. So the next time that you choose to look at somebody, as a matter of fact, by Monday, you'll probably see me look completely different when I shave off my beard and cut off all my hair again, because it's about that time of year, that remember, you can't judge a book by its cover, and you can't judge a person by the clothes they wear, nor by the outward manifestation that you see. Because sometimes you're going to discover that there's more to the person than meets the eye. The same is true about churches that you go to. You don't judge a church by a steeple. Nor do you judge it by its people. You don't judge it by its pastor. As a matter of fact, what you judge a church by is whether or not God told you to go there in the first place. You don't judge churches. You evaluate whether you should be there or not. So don't be so consumed about the outward things as much as you should be consumed about what God wants you to do on the inward things. And so every day, we take the time to read Devotionals. We take the time to seek the Holy Spirit. We take the time to walk in His way. So that way we would not be caught up by images. 
caught up by the latest buzz on the internet, caught up by some woo gotcha video that's been hacked or whacked out on the internet for somebody to go, oh no, look what they did. But maybe they didn't do it at all. The truth is we have to cling to our devotion with Jesus and our devotion to Jesus by way of his Holy Spirit revealing to us his truth so that we would not take for granted anyone, that they be a child, that they be an adult, that they be divorced, that they be white, that they be black, that they be Jew, that they be Gentile, that they be barbarian, Scythian, or free, or Muslim, or Mormon, or any other religion. We don't take them for granted, but we accept the fact that God died for them. And we share with them the gospel and the good news that they can have a personal relationship with Jesus. Because if Jesus died for every single human being in the world, how dare we look at the surface issues and not recognize the spirit of God as he works on people today? Powerful Christianity. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.18. You know, it's funny. I remember when I was in community. In community means being in a Orthodox Jewish community. And uh, <laughs> you wear different clothes. <laughs> Trust me, you do. And uh, it was fun, you know, you wear your talis katan, you know, and your talis and kippah, and, you know, you daven, and, you know, and you, I just wasn't really into phylacteries, you know, I wasn't into tefillin, you know, I could lay tefillin, you know, I knew how to lay tefillin, you know, but it just seemed dumb. So when you're in community, it's like, you know, you have one set of clothes and everybody assumes that, you know, a Jew who looks orthodox is so religious. And then you sit there and you go to, you know, when you're in the morning prayers, you know, and you're praying, you know, and the Torah is up there where you carry the Torah or you read from the Torah, you know. Then you get back and you sit down and you realize that everybody's talking business. They're not talking about God. They're not talking about Torah. They're not even necessarily praying. But they are talking business. Hmm. I always found that interesting. Most business was carried on <laughs> in synagogue. Shul, in study in daily morning prayers. Just, just kind of an insight. So never judge a book by its cover. Never go by the outward things, but sometimes when you are taken to a different world and you have to put on, say, a kafia, you know, say you were into a Afghanistan and you had to put on, you know, the garb, the clothes, the lifestyle, so to speak. Don't worry so much about what's on the outward as much as what's on the inward and try to change that from the inside out as opposed to from the outside in. Because anyone can put on a suit and tie. Anyone can talk the talk. But the real gist of it isn't just the walk the walk, but it's the heart of the matter of where the Holy Spirit resides and brings out of them the love of God, the revelation of Jesus in them. And that's what the walk is, because it's the walk with the living God. Spirit-filled people are found in every church and denomination. I know that's going to come as a shock, but hey, I went to the Catholic Church. I visited. I went to folk masses. I went to charismatic meetings, and I found a born-again priest. Oh, he wore sandals. He talked about, don't worry about Mary, you know, but focus in on the Holy Spirit and talk to God, you know, and have a personal relationship with Jesus. Catholic saying that? Hey, I'm just telling you, in every denomination and in every yeah, church, within reason, God can be there. I've been to lots of denominations. I even went to a Greek Orthodox church in Jerusalem. And you know what? I, the priest wasn't necessarily born again, but I did meet some born again Christians in there. <laughs> there are people in the strangest places that God has placed them by way of the Holy Spirit for a purpose that he's designed, not our permission to be there. 
They are people who understand the need for the power of the Holy Ghost within them, so they don't live a weak and defeated life. They live a directed life, directed by God to do that which he has told them to do. The word says to ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit from Ephesians 5.18, indicating that being spirit-filled is something to which we submit ourselves. Ask God to fill you to overflowing with his spirit so that everything you do today will be through his power, through his will done in his way. Because you see, anyone can apply for a job. Anyone can write a resume. Anyone can come up with the right credentials. They can come up with the right tools. They can come up with the right statement. They can look right. They can talk right. But unless they can do the job, it ain't right. That's all I can tell you. Because I have seen people with better resumes than I had. I have seen people with more credentials than I had. I have seen people with all the backing and not able to do the job. So, what made me able to do what I was able to do in the world, of the world, that had nothing necessarily directly to say it's quote-unquote Christian, and that it was a Christian function. That I was able to, by strength and by might and by intellect and by intelligence, be able to accomplish the jobs that I did in my life. It's the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not just only spiritual jargon that's going to come out of your mouth. It's not only spiritual fruit, but rather, whatever God wants you to do, even like Joseph in the prison, whatever God places you to be, God will give you a supernatural ability to do that work, to accomplish that purpose, to function in that job or that role or that capacity that He wants you to be in. Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the power of God. Not for yourself, but the Holy Spirit directs, the Holy Spirit leads, the Holy Spirit guides, the Holy Spirit filled Jesus and directed him into the desert, which he could not have survived without the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. So it's not our, we got the Spirit, now we can do what we want, but we can submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's leading, and he'll show us what Jesus wants.